Hey, Star Wars fans and Rule of the Galaxy fans, thank you for, well, first of all, putting up for us with us for 249 episodes so far. This is episode 250 of the Rule of the Galaxy podcast, something that my son and I started in January of 2020 and uh, didn't, think, didn't think we'd ever make it this long. And uh, we've had incredible guests. We've got great followers, great listeners. And uh, we're going to have a special guest here in just one moment. But as always, as we start the show, I'll give you a quick rundown. Um, this is episode 250 of the Rule of the Galaxy podcast. We already have lined up for future shows. Uh, my son, the, the originator of the show, Joey Molinaro, followed by Ryan McGee of ESPN and the SEC Network. Um, we just confirmed that Emily Swallow, the armorer, will be on the show here uh, in a few weeks and the author claudia gray will will be here at the end of march and then john jackson miller with his new book will be here right around the release time of that book as well so we've got a jam-packed next few weeks of, of guests and great things going on and uh as usual i'll hand it right over to one of my normal co-hosts uh alfie alfie how are you doing thanks for being here Thank you. I can't believe it's uh, 250 already. <laughs> I always say I just thought this was going to be a one-time thing, and look at us now. That's right. It's amazing how uh, just talking Star Wars and uh, just being friends online because you know we were all kind of trapped in 2020. It started where we couldn't get around each other, and then we could we could communicate via uh, Zoom and podcasts and things like that. And here it is, still you know four plus years later. And we're, we're doing this. So thanks for, for being there all this time. Um, but, you know, I think you and I are both really excited and, you know, hopefully prepared for this guest that we have this evening. Um, there, there's a few people that I put on some very high levels in Star Wars, people who've been in the inner workings, seen things, been to things, talked to everybody. And one of the people that, that we're, we're lucky enough to have on our show tonight is Mr. Steve Sansweet of Rancho Obi-Wan. And Steve, it's an honor and a pleasure to have you on the show. I'm a big fan. I've, I've followed all the things you've done. And um, I, I did get to meet you at one of the, the celebrations one time. But as usual, you you met probably 10,000 people that one weekend. But it was really cool then. And it's, it's even cooler now to be able to sit here and have a conversation with you. So welcome to Rule the Galaxy. Thank you. I am honored to be on your 250th podcast. That's amazing, guys. Congratulations. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. And I, I wish our whole crew could be here. Um, Brent's, Brent's not able to join us tonight. D-Doc will be here a little bit later. But, um, you know, I, I just really, you know, we could talk about so many things. Um, but really, I just thought you're somebody, like I said, who's been in, around everything Star Wars, seen everything Star Wars in the past. Oh, gosh, you know, four decades. Um, and, and I really just wanted to take this time to really pick your brain and hear all these great memories you have and, and hear maybe some of the craziness and bad stuff that's happened, whether it's, you know, bad memories of, uh, you know, having a, a bad uh, event at a convention or something at Rancho Obi-Wan. But first and foremost, I'm sure a lot of people, most Star Wars fans will know this, but if you wouldn't mind, before we jump into everything else, Rancho Obi-Wan is near and dear to your heart. And, it, you know, it's, it's a passion project for you. Please tell everybody a little bit more about Rancho Obi-Wan, what you do, where you are, and everything like that. Well, Rancho Obi-Wan is a nonprofit museum in Petaluma, California. It's about an hour's drive north of San Francisco. And it is my personal Star Wars collection, the stuff that I have acquired for the past, it seems like century and a half, but it's only since 1977, although the oldest item in the collection is um, We uh, have memberships. Uh, we raise money to keep the museum going. Uh, we have wonderful docents who give two to three hours to the collection. We have about 400 to 500,000 items in the collection. Wow. So the stuff that's not on display, we're always changing things around. And the items that aren't on display, we have uh, in the stacks, like a library or at an off-site warehouse, where we have about another 7,000 square feet. The museum is about 9,000 square feet. 
People always ask, well, how do you figure out how to arrange it? Is it by character? Or is it by movie? Is it by era? No, we arrange it by story. What makes sense? As you tell the stories about how things came about, how things were acquired, what it means, how it was made, and it's just you have some serious stories and you have a lot of fun stories. And our docents have followed the path that I started in 1919. 19, 19. Oh, 19, gosh. 1996? 1977. <laughs> <laughs> Star well, Wars changed my life. And Rancho Obi-Wan is a perfect example of how when you start to collect, it really doesn't do you much good to have everything in boxes in your garage or in a warehouse. You have to share it. And that's the thing I love the very most about Star Wars and that Star Wars fandom and sharing Star Wars with my fellow fans all over the world. I have had a wonderful career doing that. And we continue that here with Rancho Obi-Wan. That's fantastic. It, and, and the, the website, Rancho Obi Wan at dot org. Dot org. Okay. And, and people can go on there, buy memberships, donate, all that kind of stuff, buy passes, I'm sure, for when they're going to be making the trip out, out your way. Uh, I, I rarely, I've, I've been to California only twice in my life, and it's been quite a long time ago. So I rarely get out there. But if I ever do get a chance to get out there, you can guarantee. Uh, that will be one of the first first places I go visit. Um, you know, Steve, I, I it's really kind of weird to think about. Um, I was lucky enough to take my wife to Italy uh, a couple years ago. And you look at when you go to Italy and you see the Vatican Museum and you go see the, the Statue of David and you go see all these great art galleries and things like that. Does it ever cross your mind that a hundred years from now, 200 years from now, someone might still be coming and visiting something that you've created there with all these memories and this memorabilia at Rancho Obi-Wan. Cause I, I mean, Star Wars isn't going away. So I have to think it, it's still going to stand and be there, right? Well, we're going to make sure that it does. We have long-term plans to, I remember back in the early days of the internet and I, my assistant then Josh Ling, was getting bothered by questions. What's going to happen to Steve's collection after he died? <laughs> I said, well, put something really weird up. And Josh posted, Steve is going to be laid out in the middle of the museum and it's going to be imploded around them. <laughs> and there were one or two people out there who actually believe that. So we really have serious plans for the long-term future of the collection at Rancho Obi-Wan. We're working on that now with our board of directors. That's awesome. That's great to hear. Alfie, quick question for you. Um, do you have? Yeah. What really started the collection? I mean, obviously, you know, probably buying Star Wars figures when the original movie came out. But when did it just really start to grow into the serious collection? Well, that's a bit of a story. So let me go back to the beginning. I always collected things as a kid, whether it was baseball cards or matchbook covers or my dad sold alcoholic beverages so he brought me collections of drink stirrers back in the day bar had a kind of stir so i had weird collections as a kid but i was intense upon collecting on cassidy bread wrappers you name it i collected it as i got older and as the space age started i was fascinated by all things extraterrestrial outer space cut out headlines from newspapers which probably turned me into a journalist that was probably the uh the cause of that and um when i was an adult and had some disposable income i was collecting japanese battery operated plastic and tin robots from the 50s 60s 70s space toys i had a star trek collection a major matt mason collection I had the world's largest ET collection. <laughs> and I found out that I had the world's only ET collection. <laughs> so, and then Star Wars came out. I, I was blown away by Star Wars. I saw it at a media screening because I was a reporter at the Los Angeles office at the Wall Street Journal at that time. 
and 20th Century Fox invited journalists in Los Angeles to a media screening on the back lot of 20th Century Fox at the Darrell F. Zanuck Theater. And like every other person in that room, when the Star Destroyer came above, and we all looked up to see where it was coming from and all <laughs> giggled at ourselves, I was hooked. That is After the movie was over, I went up to the Vice President of Communications and said, can I get my screening ticket back? That was one of my first collectibles for Star Wars. Wow. And Star Wars then was an addition to everything I had. And then it became more and more and more. And so Star Wars really sort of took mm -hmm. over my life. My, my wife says it is, has done the same with me. So I, I just don't have a museum in, in my honor. So, um, well, well um, that's... That's a great starting point, and I love it because, I mean, you can't just – that 10,000-mile that journey starts with the first step, right? And so 1976, 1977 was that. I, I know you don't toot your own horn, horn a lot, and I know a lot of people know you as the person at Rancho Obi-Wan and everything like that, but I was looking back. Now, we, you, you were born in Pennsylvania, correct? Philadelphia. I'm yeah, okay. Well, you'll love this D Doc, the host who's running late. He he actually lives in the Philly area, and love loves Philadelphia. But so if I, if I was reading this correctly, I, obviously when it comes to Lucasfilm, you were the director of content management and fan relations for 15 years up until 2011, correct? Right. That's so back in 2017 as a, as a, an associate working on fan relations again. I mean, it just for most people, that'd be enough to say, I'm going to hang my hat on that, right? But you also, uh, you're on the Temple Media Hall of Excellence. Um, you were, as you mentioned, you worked for the Wall Street Journal, your award-winning uh, reporter there. You worked in the Philadelphia, the Montreal, and the Los Angeles offices. And you were a, you were a lecturer at USC for, I'm guessing, media and reporting. Yeah, I started a uh, business reporting class at okay. USC for a year. I mean, your your background right there is just amazing to just look at that. And then I think one of the things I loved is you had the quote on, on the stuff I was reading about it. You said in 1996, Steve followed his bliss um, and became the director of specialty marketing at, at Lucasfilm. If you don't mind me asking, how how did how did that kind of switch happen? You were a reporter a lecturer, you, you worked for the Wall Street Journal, and I mean, we all have a passion, right? We're, we're goofy enough to start a podcast. How do you make that switch from Wall Street Journal to boom, I'm, 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 I'm going to go and say, hey, I want to follow my dream at Lucasfilm? Well, I worked for 26 years at the Wall Street Journal, the last night of which I was bureau chief in Los Angeles, and we had a bureau that peaked at about 17 reporters. So it was a uh, pretty full-time occupation. Yeah. We were in as the crisis bureau because we had riots, mudslides, earthquakes, floods, you name it, we covered it. So um, it goes, Lucasfilm goes back to the early 90s when I first heard before the internet and some friends were talking and said, we understand that Lucasfilm is going to do an official price guide. And there had been some non-official price guides, including one called the official price guide, <laughs> a few things further. Um, and I cold called Lucasfilm. And I Sorry. This blowing in the background. <laughs> I cold called Lucasfilm and talked to the then new director of publishing and said, if anybody does a price guide, it should be me. And she said, and you are who? <laughs> and so we talked for a while and she said, well, what I really want is a price guide that has anecdotes in it. And I said, price guides don't have anecdotes. And we talked some more and talked again. And all of that led to the first book that I did on Star Wars, Star Wars from concept to screen to collectible which was an early guide to how Star Wars went from an idea in George Lucas's mind, to how it got translated to the screen, thanks to the people at ILM and the production company, 
and um, then how it became popularized by the merchandise. And I still am convinced that it's the merchandise that has really helped Star Wars become the phenomenon and stay the phenomenon that it is. So I can hardly think of any kind of product that has not had the Star Wars touch applied to it. Yeah, it, it's it's crossed the gamut there on everything that it's touched. Alfie, I'm I'm monopolizing as usual. Go right ahead if you've got a question for Steve. Yeah, um, I think I agree with Joe. That's this is kind of the interesting time that, especially for us, because as the way I view it, it was like the second age of Star Wars, the late '90s, and that encyclopedia that you wrote became like like the Star Wars Bible to me. <laughs> I mean, I read that thing front to back, I don't know how many times. What was it like working on that? And like, what well, kind of access did you get to get all that information? Well, after I did the first book and then I worked on the price guide with Tom Tumbush and his son, T.N. Tumbush, we did two editions of the price guide. And then I was working on the Star Wars Encyclopedia, the first Star Wars Encyclopedia, mm -hmm. which came out in 1997. And I was told by Lucy Wilson, who was then the head of publishing, oh, this is going to be an easy job because we've got all the stuff already done and all you need to do is put it together and write through it. And it turns out that was not true. Uh -huh. It's not an easy job. It was a difficult job. And it's one of the reasons that I left the Wall Street Journal to join Lucasfilm because I was having a problem. I was supposed to write this book. I was working full time as the bureau chief at the Wall Street Journal. And I was trying to do some things in the evening and on weekends, and it was just taking an inordinate amount of time. So um, I got a call from Lucasfilm from Lynn Hale, who had been there, who was there for 35 years as head of communications, just a wonderful, wonderful lady. And she said, Steve, do you know of anybody? We're looking for a person who would take a one year and a one year only job going around the country, going to maybe 10 or so fan conventions, talking about the special editions. So this would be going on the road in 1996 mm -hmm. and talking about special editions and also Shadows of the Empire. And I said, let's talk because I was, again, having problems finishing the encyclopedia. It was time to do something else at the Wall Street Journal, but I didn't want to stay as a super reporter. I didn't want to go back to New York. So I went up to Lucasfilm and we talked and I took the one year only job and they forgot to get rid of me for 15 years. <laughs> Love it. So it was a perfect job because I worked out of my house in Los Angeles and went out and did not 10 conventions, but about 30 conventions that year. And I worked on the encyclopedia during the week and went out and did conventions Friday, Saturday, and Sunday all around the country. And it was a great time. It was great to meet fans and get out there and just feel the pace of fandom and what was going on in fandom at the time. I can still remember doing things like asking people what their favorite movie was of the original trilogy and getting them to raise their hands and being surprised when I saw hands raised for Return of the Jedi because it then the assumption was it was either Star Wars or The Empire Strikes mm -hmm. Back, probably most for The Empire Strikes Back. But there were a lot of younger people and it turns out it was their first movie that they had seen on the big screen, probably with their parents. And they love Jedi, and there's still lots of people who say Jedi is their favorite movie, Return of the Jedi. I'm one of those. So it was, it was a big surprise to me, and it was fun to hear that and fun to meet people. And uh, and that led to, as I said, they, they started the marketing department, which had been disbanded after Return of the Jedi. And they restarted the marketing department, and the guy who came in as head of marketing said, oh, you might as well stay. <laughs> well, Steve, as, you, as usual, is not patting himself on the back enough. I, did I read correctly? 18 books, 16 of them have been about Star Wars that you've written? 
Yeah, the first one was about aversion therapy, how to cure smoking <laughs> and obesity and all that nasty stuff. The publisher thought it was, I did a front page story for the Wall Street Journal on that subject and I got approached by a publisher and I thought it was the only chance I'd have in my life to write a book. And so I wrote this book. He thought it was going to be a self-help book, but it, it very quickly ended up on the remainder tables. Yeah, I can, um, it, it's not, it probably wasn't, you know, it was a page turner for people who needed that, but it wasn't the same as, as writing Star Wars. I get you. I did a uh, science fiction toys and models uh, photo guidebook for Starlog magazine. And, um, and then my first Star Wars book was the concept of screen to collectible. That's awesome. Um, real quick, I'll give shout outs. Adam Parker chiming in. Let's go. Always great to see you, Adam. Alex saying super interesting. So I'm glad you're here, Alex. And we're trying we're trying to make it interesting. And Mr. Sansweet will definitely take care of that. And then Star Wars Thrifting, who we all follow on social media, saying, Hey, that's my best friend Steve right there. So Silver Silver volunteers for Rancho Obi Wan. Really? Okay. Yes. Hey, Silver. <laughs> there we go. Um, I think I think um you know, I, I love to travel. I, 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 it's something I want to, I'm passionate about. It's something I want to do for the rest of my life. But I look down and I see that Steve has been to conventions in London, France, Spain, Germany, Australia, Japan, Mexico, Finland. Um, where, where else, Steve? I mean, you've probably been a little bit of every, did you think back in 1996, you'd be traveling the world like this to no. talk Star no. Wars? In fact, my first two conventions were before I even joined Lucasfilm, one in Germany and one in Australia. So it was fellow fans who invited me. That's awesome. And, uh, it was a great way to kick off uh, my Star Wars fandom, meeting fans in uh, all sorts of strange places, wonderful places. Well, Conceta just made a message to you. Uh, I will say this. Conceta has been the person that I've been speaking with a lot. And she says, hi, boss. Um, she she works there with Steve, uh, Rancho Obi-Wan and everything. She has been great to deal with, Steve. Kinsetta, thank you very much for setting this up. So, um, That's our media and marketing. Yeah, she, she's been great to work with. So we appreciate that. Um, one thing that I look back on, and like you said, kind of looking at that, um, that time frame, that 96, you know, the mid-90s, all that kind of stuff, one thing that really stood out to me, and I know Alfie probably remembers this as well, was the time on uh, QVC. I mean, did you just have a blast doing QVC. the QVC shows? What's QVC? <laughs> yeah. I had, I had a wonderful time doing those QVC Star Wars collectibles show with my buddy Steve Bryant. And... Um, it was the strangest thing when I got that call. I was still at the Wall Street Journal when I did the first show. We were doing a, a show because I had done the first book and they were doing another show on the price guides. And they introduced me the first time as, as being the bureau chief at the Wall Street Journal in LA. And um, my boss said, um, can you make sure next time they don't identify you as a Wall Street Journal employee? You're I kidding me. Well, they identified the head of the Washington Bureau when he goes on an NBC show. That's a little different. <laughs> I agreed. I agreed. Um, but um, QVC was great. It was most of them were two hour shows, although there's some that were overnights. So I saw one of those. <laughs> You're the one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was when we're in that that time frame where we're like, you know, Alfie and I were both original trilogy kids growing up, and then to see, you know, the the Thrawn trilogy come out and Dark Empire come out, and then the the spe special editions come out, and to have the QVC going on, it just felt like we were recapturing our youth again, right? We, we were going back to being kids all over again. It was fine until they asked me to be the one who had to call Al Williamson and beg him to sign a hundred copies of his, one of his comics. So uh, it was, well, I don't know. They're not paying me an awful lot to do that. <laughs> I'll try to get them to increase the amount now. 
Um, Alfie, again, go right ahead. Throw something out there. Yeah, I was just kind of wondering, do you still add to the collection? Because obviously Joe and I, ND Doc and Brent, we all, you know, collect some form of Star Wars in, like, my wife knows if she asked me to pick up a prescription from Walmart to add 10 minutes, you know, to uh, the trip because I'm going to look at Star Wars stuff. Did you lose audio? Did we lose you, Steve? I don't know if we froze up or Steve did. Steve, can you hear us okay? Alfie, I can see and hear you. Yeah, Steve, I can see and hear you. And Steve is, I hear, I still see Steve. Okay, Steve, I can hear you now. Okay. I think my, my speakers just went out. Sorry about that. Okay, I'm sorry, Alfie. Go ahead, That's Alfie. okay. Yeah, just, um, you know, is there anything that, you know, you still collect? I mean, do you, are you like us? Do you go to Walmart and look at Star Wars Black Series or anything? I still collect the action figures religiously. I have a standing order with Entertainment Earth for the last 10 years for all Hasbro Star Wars stuff. And, um... I have a much lower income than I had when I was working at the Wall Street <laughs> Journal and Lucasfilm. So I've really cut down a lot on what I buy, but I buy what I love. And what I love is art and replica products. Um, my favorite thing recently is the Regal Robot replica maquettes. I just got the uh, Wampa, the replica of the Wampa mm -hmm. puppet that Phil Tippett made for the close-up shots of the Wampa and the Empire Strikes Back. And um, various fan pieces, fan art. I have a button portrait of Princess Leia, which is awesome to see. <laughs> and just lots of other fan-made objects, fan-made action figures. Um, just so many things that are just so great. It, things that really appeal to me. A lot of the things from uh, uh, Batu, Galaxy's Edge, mm -hmm. the In Fantasy products, which I really love. That make makes it look like somebody in the Star Wars galaxy was actually playing with the stormtrooper or the wooden puppet that collapses. So there's just That's, so uh... much out there. That's oh, yeah. one of my daughter's favorite parts of her video is she's picked out the stuff that's come from Galaxy's Edge because she has it too. So, you know, in her <laughs> mind, you, know, you guys are friends. There we go. Cool. Nothing wrong with having a five-year-old friend like that. You know what? They just, they look for happiness all the time. I, Steve, I don't mean to bug you with this, but Miss Concetta says we should ask you about your office. What is it about your office? Is there something special in your office? I see the great stuff behind us but she's got to have some story behind this you mean how messy it is or how full it gets <laughs> when packages come in that i don't open for a couple of weeks Concetta? <laughs> i'm Concetta sure. and her husband have helped clean out my office several times understood but understood. i love having this stuff around me the things that you see on the wall behind me are are um portraits and fun pieces that uh, fellow fans have done and artists have done putting me in the Star Wars universe. That's awesome. I, I can see, yeah, I can see your Jedi robes behind you there. So that's, that's yeah. pretty cool. I, I will say the older I get, the less I collect the figures and the more I've started to collect um, art. And, and when we go, we go to a convention every year, it's called um, the ICCC. Um, it's it's in Nashville, Tennessee. It you you should check it out if you ever get a chance. It's, it's, I was there at the first one. Okay, well we've gone the last few years and done our podcast from there. And let me tell you something, they have blown this thing out. The amount of toys, collectibles, and and for me every year that I've gone, I bought artwork because these people do such intricate, fun, just Star Wars, right? And and it just makes me happy to have it on my wall um that it's it's kind of my new thing outside of figures is to have artwork from it up there and and so i i can see obviously you have it behind you so obviously it's a big part of what you're doing now um 
but my favorite my favorite place at rancho is the art gallery and okay. i've been collecting a lot of what they call the alternate movie posters so this is star wars artists and these are mostly licensed and they have the credit lines and the title from the movie posters the actual movie posters and there are people like a guy named matt ferguson who's british paul shipper who's also british um Mark Ratz, an Australian who's done a couple of posters for Lucasfilm in Australia. But these are amazing pieces. And these days, movie companies are using mostly photo reel posters, mm -hmm. not the art like you used to see with Drew Struzan. And oh, all those great posters, John Alden, uh, Bob Peake. Um, so I love the new art that's coming out of people who grew up loving Star Wars and then turned to art as their expression of their love for Star Wars. I, I would be remiss to not mention, um, so we've got, we've got friends of the show, obviously people who've been on the show that we, we consider good friends now. Um, one, an acquaintance. I know you're very close to the gentleman, Jimmy and Jason at Rebel Force Radio, uh, we got a chance to meet them at ICCC, and Jimmy has been on our show before. Uh, great, great individuals, and I know they do nothing but talk highly about you, and they promote Rancho Obi Wan so much. So I wanted to give them a shout out with you being here because I know you mean a lot to them. And then I'm pretty sure uh, great guys. You, they are. They're fantastic guys, and they they are the leader. They're they're really the reason why other people do what we do is because of them. Um, the other one is uh, Mark Newbold from starwars.com, Star Wars Insider. He's been on our show probably six or seven times. And I tell you what, if there's if there's a better guy in the Star Wars community, I haven't met him. Mark is incredible. And he also speaks very highly of you. And he's Rachel a really, Obi really sweet guy. I've, I've known Mark for a long time and he's a good friend. He's a good man. Good man. Alfie, go right ahead. I'm taking all the stuff. Go ahead. Um, let's see, what do you feel is, or let's say, what's one of your favorite things to show off in the, at Rancho Obi-Wan? Is there one well, piece that you, you really look forward to every time? We have the world's largest Star Wars oil painting, 15 feet by 8 feet, called the Star Wars Space Opera, done by Robert X. Burden. We had it at our celebration booth one year. And uh, Robert has put it on long-term loan here, although he came wow. back for it last year for six months because he had a museum show down in the San Diego area, gallery show. And um, this is a piece that uses action figures as his subject. So kids that grew up with the action figures are looking at this piece and they're just admiring it. And uh, but I love all the artists, I said, and the the uh, urban artists who do the Star Wars action figures, um, the Severed Limbs series of action <laughs> That's figures. That's a good one. <laughs> God knows that George Lucas kept cutting off pieces of bodies <laughs> in every one of his Star Wars movies. Uh. And so... And now all the shows, all they do is stab people through the stomach, right? They don't cut off their limbs. <laughs> <laughs> and they live. Uh, yeah. Um, I don't get that. Nobody. Stab with a lightsaber through your stomach and you live. Yeah. I, only Qui-Gon. Qui-Gon's the only one who goes down with that. Yeah. Um, I was going to, I've got a few things here that mean a lot to me. And I figured you probably have seen them, have multiples of them or whatever. But I'm sure, let me get this. If you can see this nice little necklace of R2-D2, I got this. So, can you yeah. see that okay? Yes. Do you do you know much about this little old charm necklace right here? Do you have one of those, or do you know where they kind of originated from? Because I've had it for decades, um, and I, I just, I love it. I have to have it. Where it yeah. is one of the first Star Wars three-dimensional items that I ever bought, that and the C-3PO. And they were at Spencer Gifts on the checkout counter. Wow. And they come from a company called Weingaroff, 
which was a subsidiary or licensed by Factors, which did the initial posters for Star Wars, the initial commercial posters. And there were six initial licensees, and Factors was one of them. Don Post Studios was another mm -hmm. one, which made the uh, amazing masks. But um, they made necklaces, barrettes for ladies, uh, tie pins, stick pins, earrings. So there's, there's a display piece that I have that has all the little boxes in mm -hmm. it of the earrings. But that was a very popular line back then. So that goes way back to the very beginning of Star Wars merchandising. I probably got it way back then and wore it around. And I, um, yeah, nope. And here, Concetta says, I have that necklace and wear it every time I go to work at Aunt Rancho Obi Wan. That's awesome. I I never have met another person who has that. I knew I knew Steve would have it, but I'm glad that someone else has it as well. Alfie, if you have a question, go ahead. If not, I'll show another couple items and see what. Go we ahead. Need. Okay. So, Steve, sorry, I'm not good at this, but I know. I, I almost feel like I bought this gold-plated card on QVC. You did indeed. It was from a company in San Diego. In fact, I visited their offices. And, I love this card. Uh, they, did, they did gold cards. This was the company that put together the shows for QVC originally. Okay. So for the first two years, it was an outside company that was putting these shows together, and they, were, they did a lot of trading cards. And... This was their initial run into Star Wars cards. And although we had some other Star Wars trading cards, we had the metal cards in metal tins, mm -hmm. limited edition. And then you look on the underside of the tin and it says limited to 49,999. <laughs> I always thought that was a bit of a scam myself, but uh, the gold cards were really cool. And then we did some um cards that looked like early photographs and newspapers where you could see the dots and they were uh -huh. gold and silver now so. that the, both of those items like they sit uh, wherever my office is they're they're right beside me they're right next to me everywhere i go and it just brings back such great memories my favorite one and i know we're doing visual so for the people on youtube and on twitter live right now can see this my favorite one Ah. is this R2-D2 cookie jar. My mom and dad got this for me way back when. I've moved, I don't know how many times, and I feel like every time I move, it's going to shatter and I'm going to be brokenhearted. But what wasn't that also one of those early things that they could make? It sure was. It came out in late 77, early 78 from California Originals, and it had one of the early licensees. They also did a... 3PO mm -hmm. cookie jar, which came out months later because they were having problems getting the gold vacuum metalizing on the ceramic to make it look shiny. But that was an early version of, they did banks too. They did three banks. They did a an R2-D2, a Darth Vader, and a Chewbacca. Yep. Smaller banks. Yep. It, it's amazing. Like to, to look at this, it's, there's so many things in your life that you're like, oh, you know, I won this award or I, I here's a great picture of something I saw. But to have those kind of items right with me and, and know they're there, it's a comfort feeling to just know that uh, it's, it's part of my childhood and it'll stick with me. And I'll probably hand it off to my son or grandson when when I'm finished. You know, they won't they won't lay me down next to it and set it on fire and float <laughs> it um, for sure. But um, Alfie, if you don't have anything else, I was going to throw some more stuff. You tell me, I, I don't want to keep stepping on the questions. Is there, uh, anything that you've been chasing that you've been unable to acquire yet? Great question. Well, I have found the best things in a very interesting place. My own collection. <laughs> I've got so much stuff <laughs> that sometimes I forget what I have. <laughs> Oh, so it makes me last, feel so much better to hear you say that. For the last 10 years, I have been looking for a Star Wars, well, for longer than that, I mean, going back 30 or 40 years, I've been looking for a Star Wars billboard. 
I love my poster collection. Mm -hmm. I must have two to 3,000 posters and art prints. And I've been looking for a 24 sheet, which actually comes in eight to 12 sheets. I forget which number. And it's like the Star Wars half sheet. And I once turned down one because one of the edges was torn and they wanted a thousand dollars back in the late eighties for it. And Conceda and Ann Newman, who's the president and chief executive officer and longtime curator of Branch Obi-Wan and another friend of ours was up in our loft where we hadn't been probably for the last 10 years. And they were going through a pile of things and said, Steve, what's this? And I said, I'm not quite sure. You better bring it down. And it was a Star Wars billboard. The, the eight sheet Star Wars billboard. Oh which we then spread out. We were, we were looking for things for our virtual gala that year. And I said, I have no recollection when I got that, how I got it, how much I paid for it, how it came to me. And there was another poster I've been looking for, a, Hung a Hungarian uh, horizontal poster. And Anne found it in a drawer in the poster collection. <laughs> She said, is this sort of like the poster you've been looking for? And I said, that is the poster <laughs> that I've been looking for. So the best place to find something is in my collection. Incredible. Incredible. And uh, there's so much out there. There are many. I mean, you look at some of the prop auctions. I could have had the Princess Leia original end of Star Wars movie gown for only a million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> or was it a million pounds? I forget which. Um, things have really become pricey. There are some amazing things that have turned up because of that. And I'm thrilled for people who are able to get that. Um, but uh, some of the original action figures are now going for hundreds and thousands of dollars. The variants, the rocket firing Boba mm. Fett, the vinyl cape Jawa, it's gone beyond that. So... That's a whole esoteric <laughs> part of the Star Wars collecting universe that I am just not familiar with. People will ask me questions about the no neck Leia or the white teeth Lando, and I'm not quite sure what to tell them. That's amazing. Me either. No, I agree. Um, I, I have a list because I'm just so fascinated to hear your stories. Um, do you have do you have a pinch me moment when it comes to all the things you've done in Star Wars? Like you look at your sit, you know, I, I sat down, Alfie knows, we, we were at the ICCC and they looked at me and said, Hey Joe, we're gonna be interviewing Ian McDermott, the Emperor, and we'd like you to be a part of that and interview him. And I looked over and I said, Me? Um, and I could feel my heart pounding. I was, you know, I felt tingly. I we I got finished and I was like, guys, I need a few minutes, right? Um, and it was just very weird to think that a guy from Indiana who'd grown up watching this could be sitting down with Ian McDermott and interviewing. But do you have a time like that where you can say, This is something that I just can't believe I was getting a chance to do? Well, I think one of those times or several times was being on the sets of episodes one, two, and three. Um mm. uh, for a couple of days leading, helping lead the fan magazine editors. At one point we had seven international editions of the Star Wars Insider, all different magazines, but based on the Insider. And so um, one of the things that we did was bring them first to Leavesden Studios in the UK for episode one, and then to Sydney, Australia for episodes two and three. And, um, actually let them interview the, the actors and George and Rick McCallum. And so I was in on all of those standing on the set where Obi-Wan and, uh, and uh, Anakin were going at it in the final battle of Revenge of the Sith. And it was actually just a ramp all painted in green. And then seeing it in the final movie, we were on the set when um, uh, Anakin 
uh, killed the Tuscan Raiders. Mm-hmm. So it was the Sandy. It was an inside set. It was like sand and the sort of the housing structures, the teepee like uh, structures. Uh, and I thought that was amazing. Um, for episode one, it was uh, being on the set when Qui Gon's body was. Uh, cremated, memorialized, and so they brought in. They didn't burn Liam Neeson. Don't get the wrong idea. He was too expensive. So they had a wax dummy, and they had one of the standby costumes, and they had gas flames coming up. And um, George called cut, and two guys came in with fire extinguishers, put out the flames and then carried the wax dummy out the back of the outside set um, just in case they needed to reshoot it. They <laughs> needed to reuse the dummy because it was high temperature melting wax. It didn't melt. And everybody else, the set broke and everybody else went out the front of the set except for me. I figured I would trail these guys and see if anything was available. <laughs> And I went out the back. They had already left. Nowhere to be seen. But there in the grass was this wet pile of cloth and leather and even a the sole of a boot, which when I tried to touch it, immediately crumbled into a million pieces. But I took that and I took the other pieces of leather and a food pellet from the belt and i stuffed them in my pocket which immediately got wet so people stared at me for the next four hours (laughs) but i have parts of qui-gon's burn costume well what was that movie line um if if peeing your pants is cool i'm miles davis you can change it now (laughs) if peeing your pants is cool i'm steve sansweet um that's absolutely awesome that's awesome um when i like i said that pinching moment of being able to interview femi taylor who played ula or ian mcdermott who played the emperor or uh vanessa marshall who played hera you know these are things that i never thought that we would do as a podcast are there all great people by the way they are all wonderful people i've had a fortune to meet femi's been here femi has visited rancho obi-wan really yeah well you know i'm going to change my question then because that sparks another one are there people who've come to rancho obi-wan that you sit there and go i can't believe they're here or this is incredible to have them at this place that i've helped create Well, we've had a bunch of people from um, the original trilogy visit the collection. Dave Prowse, Kenny Baker, uh, Jeremy Bullock, who was a good friend, Boba Fett. Um, Did I say Peter Mayhew? Uh, No. Oh, Peter, Femi Taylor. And then we've had some of the voice actors from the Clone Wars. So there's been a bunch of people who have been here or at the collection when it was in Los Angeles. Where have there been people like have all of a sudden out of the blue a politician or a CEO of a company or something like that that you weren't expecting been at at Rancho Obi-Wan ever? Somebody like just blew you away outside of Star Wars. You mean like Steve Jobs? Yeah, like that. Yeah, that's pretty up. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, so like nobody like Arnold Schwarzenegger has to just accidentally stop by and said, I want to see this place. Well, we're only open for tours. Okay. You have to schedule in advance and we can <laughs> see by the names of people on the website who's coming. Okay. So sometimes I'll see names. Wait a second. I used to buy Star Wars stuff from these people back in 1977. <laughs> And that really happened a couple wow. of months ago. Okay. All right. So you never know who's going to show up here. We've had people from all over the world, especially before the pandemic, but people yeah. are starting to travel more again. Okay. Alfie, hit hit away. In uh, watching your 
walkthrough videos on YouTube, how do you preserve like the food items that you have on display? Oh, that's a good, messy question. <laughs> well, sometimes you're safe. Like I've got Coca-Cola bottles from Canada right. from 1978, and they're sealed, and they're in a carton. And the fizz is gone, and they're not going to leak. Sometimes you have a can of Heinz pasta bits with Jar Jar Binks hologram on them, and they explode on the shelf. <laughs> so the best thing to do, or you have... Um, a chocolate Jar Jar Easter Bunny from Canada, which lasted for 20 years. And then we came in one day and saw nibbles out of it. So the best thing you can do is like, I got some Star Wars celebration cakes when I was in the UK. And you take a photograph of the cake and then you eat it or throw it away. In this case, it was so bad, we threw it down the uh, garbage disposal of a good friend where we were staying and unfortunately i think i had to pay a plumber's bill because it clogged oh. the garbage disposal it was so terrible <laughs> but the photo and the box and some things you have to get rid of and i'm a little uh, reluctant sometimes to open things like uh yogurt mm. yogurt tubes but it's the packaging that you really want to save. I came back from France once and I thought I had cleaned packaging very well. There was this big promotion in France from a, ma a food manufacturer and they sold raw chicken parts, thighs, breasts, legs, etc. cetera. And it's, it was in Star Wars packaging and there were 80 different kinds of Star Wars packaging uh. and they came with magnets or little cards and they did pizzas and sandwiches, but mostly chicken parts. And I was in this very small hotel, this boutique hotel, and I was cleaning out. I couldn't bring <laughs> chicken parts back to the U.S. I didn't have space, number one. And of course, I wasn't going to bring raw chicken to France. <laughs> And so I was cleaning out the packages with soap and water. I didn't know what to do with the chicken. And so I put the raw chicken in the very tiny waste basket. And the next morning when I was leaving the room and checking out, I looked at the waste basket and realized it looked like human flesh. And I thought, the cops are going to come. <laughs> the, gend the gendarmes are going to bust me because of Star Wars. Luckily, nothing happened. That is imagine fantastic. the poor cleaning lady. Uh, uh, no, no, that does not sound. Hey, but you got away with the things you want to get away with the packaging, right? So, that's, absolutely, that's good stuff right there. Um, I guess I'll do some general questions real quick because I, I don't want to keep. I don't want to keep you. Go ahead, go ahead. You're gonna let me it. mention something. We have a, a special going that we are going to be putting up on the website. Um, uh in today or tomorrow we have we've been doing memberships since 2012 and with each membership comes a patch mm -hmm. and then you get a pin the year after if you renew your membership so a lot of people are reluctant because they're completists you know we star wars collectors are completists sometimes on certain areas so we're doing an instant charter membership like is if you started in 2012 and you get 13 patches, 12 pins, one 10th anniversary zipper pull. So that'll be posted on the RanchoObiWan.org website either late later tonight or tomorrow. And we've already emailed people who are members or who were members, telling them, giving them a specific link to fill in their collection for what they missed. So we depend on memberships. We depend on tours uh, to help keep us running. The utility costs out here in California have just gone through the roof and insurance costs too. So everything helps. I, I this gotta, is a great way to catch up. I think that's fantastic. So RanchoOB1.org. Let, you know, for anybody who's listening and this is going live tonight, but it'll be out on the podcast tomorrow. So anybody who checks that out, go check out RanchoOB1.org. 
to see about signing up as that member and getting getting those special deals going on. I think that's fantastic. You mentioned insurance. I can't even imagine. I mean, insurance is bad enough alone just to have insurance. But with all the material you have there, I've got to imagine you've got some hefty insurance bills to uh, protect all that, keep all that covered in case of loss or anything. Yeah, but so much is one of a kind that, you know, insurance is there, but it only does so yeah. much for you. Yeah, you are you are right about that. Um, Alfie, I was going to ask some questions. Steve, I, I, I don't think I've ever heard you say, like, your favorite movie, if you have a favorite character or a favorite book, any of those kind of things. Um, throw well, that this out is there. Not, this is oh. not Rancho Jar Jar, although I love Jar Jar <laughs> from a certain point of view. Um, but Rancho Obi-Wan, Obi-Wan was my favorite character in the films, um, in the original trilogy, because he was the mentor. He really mm -hmm. set Luke on his path to become a Jedi and to save the galaxy. And um, in my personal and professional life, I have been a mentor too. I've hired people at both the Wall Street Journal and at Lucasfilm and have followed their careers and tried to help them and be there as a resource. And so Obi-Wan was my favorite. As far as my favorite film that goes back and forth between Star Wars and The Empire Strikes Back. And now I'm sort of leaning a little more towards Star Wars because without Star Wars, there wouldn't be anything else. Right. Okay. Um, Alfie, I, I don't want to keep Steve more. I, I, an hour, you know, it was a long time. I wanted to make sure we got everything in. Any questions you have for him to kind of, as we start getting close to the end? Kind of a, I don't know if it's a weird question or not, but what kind of environment do you keep the ranch at? Like as far as storing everything to avoid any, you know, anything decaying or degrading? It's tough with so much stuff. I mean, we try to keep uh, the temperature at around 65 degrees all year round. And um, we worry about the humidity, but we don't have a high, high, uh, hygrometer, whatever the thing that measures humidity is called. Um, we dust twice a year. We don't have any windows. It's sort of like Las Vegas. You don't know what it's doing outside. <laughs> Um, although we do have clocks. Um, so um, we do the best we can. And um, we s haven't had to restore anything. But we try to keep things in as best shape as possible. You got it. You got it. Well, um, like I said, I, I, I can't. Thank you enough. I, I wanted to make sure that when when Concetta said you were available, I, I jumped at the chance, especially with it being our 250th episode. Uh, you're a person that I've respected in the Star Wars community for years. I know Alfie is the same, and, and we really appreciate you taking the time to come on, answer all of our questions, tell these great stories that just, you know, I mean, Star Wars fans of today, younger fans, they got to know, you know, it, 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 we're all here at this point in time with Disney and with all the new things coming out, it wouldn't be there if it wasn't for the, the stuff that was from the seventies, the eighties that, that really made this thing take off and be what it is today. So, um, Alvy, any closing thoughts from you as, as things you want to talk to Steve about? No, just really, thank you so much. It's been a, a great time. It's been my pleasure. And again, congratulations on your two fiftieth. Hey, That's an amazing mark. We, Thank you we so could, much. We we couldn't we couldn't have had a, a better guest, and and we we really appreciate what you do. And I can tell you, thanks to Concetta, uh, you know she's been a wonderful person to work with, and we will do our best with all of our followers, listeners, and everything like that uh, to make sure they know about that deal at RanchoOB1.org that will be coming out soon. So. Um, Thank you so very much. I, I, I hope our paths cross at uh, some future convention or, or if I can get out that way and Alfie can get out that way. We, that would be awesome. Know, yeah, we'd, we'd love to come and see Rancho Obi-Wan. So thanks for your time. We, we appreciate it. And um, we're going we're gonna to close it out here for all of our fans and listeners. Thanks for being a part of episode 250 of Rule of the Galaxy. Again, 
Uh, we've got Joey Molinero, Ryan McGee, Emily Swallow, Claudia Gray, and John Jackson Miller all coming up. So, you know, Steve's just kicking it all off right here. He's he's the headliner, and and they're going to play follow and, and follow the leader with him. So thanks again, and until next time, may the force be with you.